We're glad you're here today to help us celebrate God's greatness and goodness in our lives. What a great way for us to start the new year in worship, and it's so fantastic to have you here. A few months ago, we announced that we would soon begin the search for an associate preaching minister. We have been doing some searching and prayer about that. The elders and I made the decision a few weeks ago that we wanted to hire a search firm to assist us in this process. Uh, This is a fairly common practice among churches in America to help find somebody who will be just the right fit. And so we have engaged the Slingshot Group to assist us in this process. One of the reasons we chose this firm is because we felt such a connection with them prayer-wise. Every time I would talk with them, any correspondence I had from them said, you know, um, we want you to know that we are praying for you and we're praying for Bridgeway Church. And that was very powerful and influential in the decision that we made. We expect this process to take six to 12 months. We're not sure just how long it'll be, but once this guy comes on board, uh, he will share the preaching with me for about a year. And then our hope is to pass the baton on to him so that he'll do most of the preaching. Now, you're not getting rid of me. Uh, I'll still be around God's purpose. Uh, for a number of years after that in other capacities. But we want you to be just praying about this. It's really one of the most important things you can do for this new year. Uh, We don't know who this guy is, but God knows who he is. And we're praying for God to bring us a man of great passion, great holiness, great character, great love for the Lord. One of the things that's never going to change about Bridgeway is that we will always be passionate about being a church without walls. So we want you to know that we are committed to that, but we are asking you to pray that God will help us find exactly the right man uh, for this purpose. So let's bow this morning and ask God to bless us. God, you're so good. You have blessed Bridgeway so uh, fully and richly from the start of our beginning just a few years ago. And now we ask God that you would uh, provide direction from your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would lead us to precisely the person who can best continue and lead in preaching and serving this church. God, thank you for showing us Christ and giving us direction through your word. We pray for your continued wisdom and help us always, God, to be a people who are passionate about being a church without walls. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Rafael Lozano is a man with a mission. In fact, it's kind of a weird mission. Uh, His goal in life is to visit every Starbucks location on the planet. And he started this quest in 1997. He has traveled over 150,000 miles. He has spent over $100,000. He has visited 11,733 Starbucks locations. And every time he goes, he drinks a cup of coffee and then he takes a selfie. And we've got a few of those selfies this morning. The first one is in Korea. I mean, this guy really must be full of beans. He's ready to travel halfway across the world to find a Starbucks location. The next one is in California. Maybe he's operating on a coffee high, I'm not sure. The next one's in Colorado. Uh, Maybe this is after drinking some decaf. And then finally, we have a selfie of him in Indiana. This guy is on a mission. But, you know, it's interesting what he says about himself. First, he says... I'm never going to be able to accomplish the mission. It's totally unachievable because Starbucks keeps building all these new locations. I can't keep up at that frenetic pace. And second, he says, really his mission is pointless because he says, every time I visit a new Starbucks, I think I've accomplished something, but the reality is I've accomplished nothing. Wouldn't that be a sad thing to say about your life? You spend your life in pursuit of some goal, some mission, some objective, and then you reach the end of that and you go, you know what? I really haven't accomplished anything. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so helpful for us to think about grave markers. I'm not trying to be morbid this morning, but I want to show you a picture of a grave marker that might represent my life. You know, typically when we think about a grave marker, we think about the date of birth and the date of death. In my case, the date of birth, July 5th, 1951. I don't know when the date of death will be. God knows when that's going to be. But you know what's really important about that? It's not the date of birth and it's not the date of death. What's really important is the dash between those two dates. That's all that God is really concerned about. 
It's not a big deal when you were born or when you will die so much as it is, what are you doing with your dash? How will you spend the dash of your life? How will you spend the time in between the date of your birth and the date of your death? Envision your own grave marker this morning. You can fill in the blank for the date of your birth. And again, God knows the date of your death, but what are you doing to spend your dash in the right way? And wouldn't it be sad to come to the end of your life and realize that you've wasted your dash? You know, God is passionate about how you use your dash. And one of the best biblical evidences of that is Matthew chapter 25. Jesus tells this parable. A master has three servants. He gives one guy five talents, another two, another one. And these guys do different things. The first guy is busy working at what it is that God has given him. And so at the end of time, the master comes and he gives him five more talents. And the same with the man with two talents. He gets to double his. But the guy with one talent is, he's uh, really feeling just disturbed about the master. He says, I knew that you were uh, a strong master, that you were an exacting master. And I was intimidated by that. And so I just took this talent and I buried it in the ground. And the master said, what are, you, what are you thinking? At the very least, you could have taken the talent and put it at the bank for interest. And so now what you have is going to be taken from you. And he says, you're going to be cast into outer darkness. There are three myths associated with that parable. The first is that really God doesn't have any concern about how it is that you use your talents. That's not at all true. If you read this parable carefully, you realize God is very concerned about what you do with the resources with which he's blessed you. The second thing is, sometimes we think that at the end of time, there's going to be this kind of general uh, commendation. But again, if you look at the parable in detail, you realize there's a very strong connection between how you use the gifts and the talents and the abilities that you have and what it is that you will be given in the future in terms of future opportunity. And then third, sometimes we live with the myth, which we need to debunk, that really the worst that could happen would be no reward. But again, the parable says that if we don't use what it is God has given us, that we can suffer loss. It can be taken away. How you spend your dash is critically important. And so we're going to be talking about how you spend your dash and what it is that God wants you to do with your life. You know, God has amazing purposes for your life, and you need to know what they are. In fact, he has five major purposes for your life. Here they are, worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and mission. Those are the five great purposes of your life. And today we want to explore that first, which is worship. You know, everybody worships. Even if you don't believe in God, you worship because you were wired that way. You are built to worship something. So maybe you worship your career, or maybe success, or maybe pleasure, or maybe sex, or maybe some substance, or sports, But everybody worships. And you say, well, that's not the real problem in my life. But you know what? It's the number one problem in most people's lives. It really is. And when you worship something other than God, what happens is you fall into a pattern of stress and conflict and chaos in your life. It's just inevitable. And you see, you can't determine the purpose for your life because you didn't make you. God's the one who made you. He's the only one who's qualified to tell you what it is that's your purpose in life. And so listen to Ephesians chapter 1. It's in Christ we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and every one. God didn't put you on this earth just to take up space. And your life is not about you. It's not about you. Your life is about Christ. People come to church looking for answers. They want to know, how can I find fulfillment in my life? How can I find purpose in my life? Here's the answer. You have to die to yourself and to live for Christ. That's the only way you'll find your real purpose. And it's the only way you'll find joy in your life. One of the best verses on worship in the Bible is Romans 12, verse 1. I'm going to give you in just a minute the message paraphrase, but first we'll start with the New International Version. I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies as holy sacrifices, pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. I want you to circle two words in that verse. First, the word because. Because of God's mercies. And second, the word offer. Listen to the paraphrase. 
Because of God's great mercy to us, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. See, it starts with because of. Because God always makes the first move. He created you. He sustains you. He gives you every breath you have. He draws you to himself. If you choose to follow him, he saves you. He forgives you. He adopts you into his family, and he keeps you going right to the end. So that's the because of, and then there's the word offer. That's how we are to respond to the because of, to God's goodness. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you're a parent. Okay, thank you. You know what it's like when your children thank you for something, don't you? How that pleases you, how that makes you feel honored. God wants you to honor him, and he says you're to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, those animal sacrifices were dead sacrifices. They were placed on the altar, and they were totally consumed. But now, God says, I want your life to be a living sacrifice. You're to be totally consumed. Every part of who you are is to be given over to me. It's the sum total of who you are. I think sometimes it's a bit like husbands and wives, you know, they go to the marriage altar and they say, I do. And they take that vow and they're saying, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor this covenant. I'm going to be with you for the rest of my life. But sometimes they have no idea. Most of the time we have no idea what the living out of that is going to look like. We don't know what the implications of that are going to be like. And so maybe you take care of your spouse for the rest of your life, even though he's sick or she's sick. You encounter difficulties and challenges and hurdles along the way, but you have said before God, this is a covenant that I will honor. The same thing is so often true in our relationship with God. We come to God and we say, I do. I'm here, I'm committed to you, I'm totally passionate about following you, and we have no clue what the living out of that is going to look like. And God says, I want you to remember that that I do was your declaration that you were going to say, I will be a living sacrifice. Well, what do you offer a God who has everything? I mean, maybe at Christmas time you tried to buy a gift for somebody who has everything and you kind of struggle with that. What do you offer a God who's made the earth and he owns everything and he has everything? Well, God says, let me tell you about three things you need to give. And, and Jesus talks about it in Mark 12, verse 30. He says, here's the great command. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. There are three things that God will never have unless you give those things to him. First, he will never have your attention unless you give your attention to him. Second, he will never have your affections unless you give your affections to him. And third, he will never have your abilities unless you give your abilities to him. So first of all, worship means focusing your attention on God. That's what Jesus means when he says you're to worship God with all of your mind. Listen, we are living in the most anti-intellectual period of history in Western civilization. And so many people are governed by their emotions instead of their convictions. And they're not really bothering to use the muscle of their mind to learn better how to know God. That's one of the reasons why it's so important for you to have a daily quiet time with God in which you dig into the Word of God. If you don't hear anything else that I say this morning, hear this carefully. For you to grow in your knowledge of God, your love for God, your worship of God, you've got to be in the Bible. You've got to be in the text. Get yourself a good study Bible, or maybe the Quest Bible that answers a lot of the thorny questions related to certain texts, but whatever else you do, make sure you're engaging your mind in the study of God's Word, because you can't know the attributes of God. You can't know His character. You can't know His purposes unless you're involved in the Word of God. And God wants you to focus your attention on Him, because He focuses all of His attention on you. Listen to Psalm 139. Psalmist says, You have looked deep into my heart, Lord, and you know all about me. You know when I'm resting or when I'm working. You notice everything I do and everywhere I go. Listen, the reason God made you is to love you. He made you to give you his attention. He knows your every thought, your every fear, your every apprehension, your every tear. He knows everything about you. And he wants you to love him back. You know, sometimes I have uh, men who say to me, well, you know, My wife and my kids say that I don't love them, and I work so hard to provide everything that they need. And I have to say, you're not giving them maybe your attention. You see, God gives his attention to you. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. When somebody turns his face toward you, what does he do? 
He's giving you his undivided attention. When God turns his face toward you, he is saying, I have no place I'd rather be than in this moment. There's no place I'd rather be than this place. And then the writer says, he shine, make his face to shine upon you. That's an image of delight. I remember people saying to me after Holly and I got married, I've never seen you, Art, so, look so full of joy because you were watching Holly. She came down the aisle. I was, I was just so full of joy. It's the image of a beaming parent when your child does something that pleases you. God smiles on you, and he wants your attention, but how do you give him your attention? Well, you can't do it without a daily time alone with him. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 6. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. Sometimes we think of time spent with God as discretionary. It's unconditional. It's non-negotiable. Some of you would never consider the possibility of starting your day without a meal. Most of you wouldn't. Many of you would never start your day without a time of exercise. But when it comes to being with God, somehow it falls out of your priorities. You got to make sure that it's the number one priority in your day. You got to make sure that you're spending time alone with the Lord. June 2012 article in the New York Times struck a nerve for a lot of people. The article received over 800 comments. It was often quoted and retweeted. And the following quote captures the essence of the author's analysis of what he calls the busy trap. He says, if you live in America in the 21st century, you've probably had to listen to a lot of people tell you how busy they are. It's become the default response when you ask anyone how they're doing. Busy, so busy, crazy busy. It is pretty obviously a boast disguised as a complaint. And the stock response is a kind of congratulation. That's a good problem to have. Or better than the opposite. Busyness serves as a kind of hedge against emptiness. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you're so busy, completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. We're busy because of our own ambition or drive or anxiety because we're addicted to busyness and dread what we might have to face in its absence. Listen, if you are too busy to find time with God, you need to reestablish your priorities. You need to make time for the Lord. You need to spend time in Bible study. You need to spend time talking to him in prayer. And it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to use fancy words. In fact, maybe the simpler the words, the better. Just talk with him. Just just open a conversation with God. Maybe the first thing you do when you get in your car every day, just spend 10 or 15 minutes talking to the Lord. I know a guy who sets his watch to go off every 30 minutes so that he can refocus his attention on who God is. And the payoff for focusing on God is huge. Listen to Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. You know what I've discovered? When my thoughts are not fixed on God, I can be full of insecurity and worry and fear. But when my thoughts are focused on God, all that begins to dissipate and just dissolve. Because God has the capacity to handle any problem that I have. God can do anything as easily as he does anything else. It's just as easy for God to create a universe as it is for God to create a doodlebug. You think about the galaxies. We sang about the galaxies this morning. We live in the Milky Way galaxy, which is this oblong pinwheel spinning through space. It is 20,000 light years across, 100,000 light years long. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. If you want to travel across our galaxy, you can do it in 20,000 light years, moving at the speed of light. Or if you want the long scenic route, it'll take you 100,000 years. Do you really believe that a God who creates that can handle your problems? You know, we think of our sun as being huge, and it is 110 times larger than the earth, but it's so tiny compared to some of the other places in the galaxy, like the star Antares. If you think about the star Antares as a big globe, you could take our sun, the moon, and all the planets out to the edge of Mars and place all that inside Antares. That's how huge Antares is. And that's just a tiny little, tiny little place in our universe. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't know whether God is great enough to create a fish that could, could accommodate Jonah. 
Listen, God is so great, he could have air conditioned and carpeted that fish if he wanted to. It's no big deal to God. And then you think about God's sovereignty. That God will orchestrate all the purposes of the earth according to his redemptive purpose. Everything ultimately will fall into God's control. And sometimes we have questions about that because we look at the flow of our lives and it doesn't really seem that way. But go visit Greenland and you'll see the ice flows and then you'll see the icebergs. And the ice flows are moving across the top of the water and they're going in one direction and then you see the icebergs going the opposite direction. How do you explain that? It's really pretty simple. The wind blows those ice flows across the surface. They're moving one way, but the ocean currents are driving those huge icebergs the opposite direction. And sometimes we look at the basic surface of our lives and we think, man, things here at the surface are so bad. And maybe God isn't in control, but the reality is God is moving those ocean currents, those icebergs, through the power of his massive currents. He will accomplish his purpose. So God is sovereign. When we look at the wheel of history, we don't have to say things are out of control because God is sovereign. Disease is not sovereign. Governments are not sovereign. Presidents are not sovereign. Politicians are not sovereign. Kings are not sovereign. Death is not sovereign. God is sovereign. And because of that, we focus our attention on him and we say, God, how great you are. And it's not about me. But second, worship is not only focusing your attention on God, it's expressing your appreciation to God, expressing your affections for God. That's what Jesus means when he says, love God with all of your heart and soul. Love him with all your heart and soul. God wants you to love him passionately. You know, this might be hard for some of you because maybe you grew up in a family where there wasn't a lot of affection. Seems kind of weird to you to say, God, I love you. But he wants you to say, I love you. You know, there's a fascinating story in 2 Samuel 6. The Ark of the Covenant has been away from the people of Israel for 20 years. And the Ark of the Covenant is not just a box. I mean, it's a big deal. Because the Ark of the Covenant represented the glory and the power and the majesty of God. It accompanied the people everywhere they went. And as it accompanied the people, they were victorious in battle. But now, for the last 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant has been parked in a Philistine city. And finally, David sends 30,000 men to recapture the Ark. And they bring it back. And First Chronicles chapter 15 says that David appointed musicians and singers before the Lord. And then what did David do? David stripped down to a slinky linen ephod and he started dancing before the Lord. This is not a waltz, it's a dance. And there were people who were really troubled by this, mainly his wife, Michael. And this might violate our comfort zones that David strips down to this simple tunic made for the servant of a priest. But you see, he wants to be uninhibited. He's dancing before the Lord. He's prancing when he thinks about God providing manna for the people in the wilderness. He's dancing. He's twirling in the air. He's jumping for joy as he thinks about God giving the people of Israel victory. That's one of the reasons why your worship ought to be uninhibited. It's one of the reasons why your corporate worship is so important. It's important for you to be in corporate worship every Sunday of this new year. You know, Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, don't neglect the meeting of yourselves together as is the habit of some. Don't neglect it and put passion into it. You see, the purpose of your corporate worship is not to evaluate what's going on up here. It's not to produce this scorecard that says, well, Art did this today or Will did this way or somebody else did this way today. No. It's what did you put into corporate worship? You're not the audience. God is the audience. And so God is saying, I want you to unleash this lavish praise because that's, that's what I'm worthy of. And that's the only way you'll be able to find joy in your life. See, God frees you from your preoccupation with yourself. He loves you that much. He says, I want you to understand the only way for you to discover real purpose in life is to worship me with great passion. Listen to Isaiah 43, 6. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. You know, sometimes we think we have to make a choice between finding joy and giving God glory. But the reality is those two are always connected. You'll never find real joy until you give God glory. Let's suppose you went to a Mavericks game and Mark Cuban 
had made the order that muzzles were to be distributed to everybody as they walked into the arena. I mean, would you enjoy the game? You couldn't shout? You couldn't cheer? Maybe a, a mandate issued, you can't clap? You can't applaud? I know Dirk has become the sixth leading scorer in NBA history, but sorry, you got to keep all that cheering to yourself. Would you enjoy the game? It'd be really hard to do it. And the same thing happens in worship. When we come into worship, we have to be expressive. We have to say to God, God, I love you so much. And as we do that, we learn what it is to find real joy. God wants you to say I love you to him because he said it first to you. Listen to Psalm 86, 12. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. God has said I love you to you in a thousand ways. Zephaniah three seventeen. God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do you realize that the highest purpose of your life is to know and love God? And it really doesn't make any difference what else you accomplish with your life. If that's not what it is that you come to in your life, then it's a dash wasted. So you ought to get up every morning, sit on the edge of your bed and say, God, when I reach the end of this day, I want to be able to say, I know you better and I love you more. The rest of your day can be wrecked, but if you're able to say at the end of your day, I know you better and I love you more, then that's a good day. And conversely, you can knock 24 things off of your to-do list, but if you don't come to the end of your day knowing God better and loving him more, then it's a day wasted. God wants you to love him passionately. Let's suppose I went to Holly and I said, Holly, here's some flowers, and I have three strategic reasons for giving you these flowers. First is, I'm your husband. Second, this is our anniversary. And third, husbands are supposed to give their wives flowers on their anniversary. You think she'd be happy with that? Of course not. She's not looking for duty, she's looking for desire. And the same is true in your relationship with God. He's not looking for you to go through some kind of arbitrary list, check, 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 check. He's looking for your heart. So how do you express your affection to God? You start just by saying thanks. You start by getting up in the morning and saying, God, thank you that I have water. I have clean water. I have hot water. Thank you that I live in a safe community. Thank you that I have freedom. Thank you that because of your work in my life, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've done for me. See, worship is not something you watch, it's something you do. Worship is a verb. It isn't that which you, brings you into being a spectator, it's how you participate. You shout to God, you sing a new song, you dance before him, you clap your hands, you bow down, you lift up your heads, you tell of his might, you stand in awe, you meditate, you walk in his ways, you still your heart, you cast down your idols, you run to him, you make a loud noise, you lift your hands, you strike up the band. Maybe you remember a time in your life when you felt this heated desire for God, but it's not there right now. Maybe you're emotionally broken. Or maybe you feel just so spiritually empty, just deep inside, you just feel like it's a wilderness. One of the best things I can recommend is that you pour yourself into the worship of God. You know, sometimes it's a little bit like exercise. If you've been away from exercise for a while, you start, it's so laborious, man, it's so hard, but then you start to exercise, and then the endorphins come, and you, you look forward to it. And the same principle can apply in terms of your worship of God. Sometimes you're far away from God and then you throw yourself into that and what happens? God begins to build and fuel that desire. But if you have a small desire to worship, you have a small God. If you bring little bitty sacrifices to God, it's because you have a little bitty concept of who God is. And God is saying, I'm so expansive, I'm huge, I'm beyond anything that you know. You have to learn to worship me. So our lives sometimes shrivel into insignificance and meaninglessness. We just kind of bump along in this mass of humanity, and we chase down all these dead-end paths that lead us nowhere, and we fret, and we get depressed, and we get discouraged, and God is saying, I want you to understand that I'm bigger than anything in the universe. I am the infinite, limitless God. So give yourself to me, worship me 
passionately express your affections for me. Worship means the spotlight is on God and only God. You know, when, again, when you come to church, the primary question is not, what did I get out of it? It's, how did I do? Arturo Toscanini led an orchestra in a brilliant performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And afterwards, people rose to their feet and they applauded. And Toscanini just started waving his arms. He said, stop. He said, the orchestra is nothing. I am nothing. But Beethoven, Beethoven is everything. And that's really the attitude we ought to have in worship. That we are nothing, but God is everything. And we express our affections to him. Well, third, worship is using your abilities for God. God wants you to love him practically. You know, it's important to give hugs and kisses. It's important for me to say to Holly, I love you, but if I didn't take out the garbage, I'm not sure how much that would mean. God wants you to put into service your affection for him. Listen to Colossians 3.23. This is a verse that can revolutionize your life. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Worship is giving your everyday life to God. See, the problem is not so much what you do, but who you do it for. You need to realize that your boss is God. That you work for God. And if you do a lousy job in your work, you're not honoring God. Don't be chained to your work. Don't be a slave to your work. But bring excellence to your work and recognize that God made you for the purpose of working out worship in the context of your everyday life. Let me ask you, how many of you are ministers? Raise your hand if you're a minister. All right, now, anybody in this room who's a believer in Christ, would you raise your hand? Some of you are smiling because you know this is a trick question that I like to ask. See, if you're a believer in Christ, you are a minister. It's not just the staff who are ministers. It's not just the executive volunteers. It's not just the elders. If you're a believer in Christ, you're called to be a minister. You're a minister disguised as a teacher, disguised as an IT worker, disguised as a salesman, disguised as an everyday mom taking care of those kids. What a great ministry that is. But you see, it's, again, not so important what you do, but who you do it for. Let me take you back to Romans 12 for just a minute. Take your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. There's that word offer again. Offer is the essence of worship. So what if you got up tomorrow morning and you said, you know what, I'm going back to the same job I've had for the last five or 10 or 20 years, but today I'm going to see it differently. Because I realize that I'm doing this for God, I'm using this context to be able to place a witness for Christ. I'm maximizing my opportunities. You are giving your abilities to God, and therefore you're loving him with all of your strength. All of your strength. So God made you. He sustains you. He gives you all that you have. But then most importantly, you worship him because of what he has done in history to save you and me. Will talked about it this morning in our communion thought. You see, God has acted in Christ to rescue us from our sins. That's the most important reason we worship him. If you want a great picture of worship, go to Revelation chapter 5. It pictures worship in heaven. And when he had taken it, that is the, the golden bowl, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, for they will reign on the earth. When Christ takes the scroll, the elders and the living creatures fall down like cut timber before him. Comes the lamb as he gives his life for you and for me. And he lays down his life so that you and I could be rescued. They're holding these golden bowls of incense, which represent the prayers of the saints. And it's John's way of describing for us the fact that the prayers are going to be answered. And even those people throughout human history who've been martyred for the faith, especially those people, are going to be honored. They're going to see their prayers answered. They're going to be vindicated. They're going to be honored. They're going to be rewarded because they've made great use of their dash. 
How are you using your dash? And when you reach the end of your life, how will your dash be assessed? Will you be able to hear from Christ those words, well done, good and faithful servant? You've been faithful with a few things, now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. In just a minute, I'm going to lead prayer, and then uh, as I do that, the worship band is going to come up, and we're going to sing some songs of praise. And my hope is that, that during uh, these next few minutes, you will praise God like you've never praised Him before. Your heart will be so full of love and praise and gratitude for what it is that Christ has done for you, you say, wow, I'm so thankful. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude. I want to give you every ounce of passion that I can give you because you have given everything for me. Let's bow and pray.